day here with um, Sanity for Sweden uh, and um, we're going to talk today about some of the developments in Australia and along with some, some other things. And uh, one of the, I think uh, uh, Stefan covered this on one of his videos just a day or so ago, I think he spoke at length about um, uh, Fraser Anning and, and how you admired some of the things he'd been saying. Um, but there is anything that you and you think the viewers might like to know about uh, Fraser Anning in Australia? I'm certain about this. I think Fraser Browning is one of those guys that we have been looking for. We look for these guys. We look for them here in Europe and definitely in the United States, but also Australia. We need these guys who has the balls to stand up and take some crap from media and the lefties and still stand up and keep talking. And uh, my experience with Fraser Anning is not it's not a big one you know I've been watching some interviews and uh, re recently a press conference and you, I just uh, like the guy you know it's it's one of those moments when you feel like hey this guy is good you know I would I would support this guy and we are looking for them they are so needed in this uh, society in this mess that the globalists are trying to create here on planet Earth. Yeah, it's amazing how successful the globalists have been at, at taking control of the major parties across the Western world. And you know, Britain is an example. The the Labour Party and the Conservative Party they they pretty much uh, agree on all the globalist issues. They have some minor things at the edges they may dispute. Uh, some maybe want with higher taxation, others a bit lower. But but really on the on the key globalist issues they're all in agreement, and it's the the same here in Australia. And from what you've been saying, it's it's also pretty much the same in Sweden, for example. The the major parties are all in agreement. So without new parties and new politicians, you know, it, it's very clear, as you say, that that it's going to be very difficult to, to stop the globalists or, or even to disrupt them. And, and uh, you know, there's Donald Trump, there's Brexit, there are some things there, but, but uh, without people like the, uh, the Fraser Annings. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Fraser Anning because he, he's an interesting, interesting sort of uh, politician here in Australia. There's, there's not many... In Australia, there's a, a system of the House of Representatives, very similar to, to the, the Westminster system in Britain, and the Senate in Australia, which is similar, I guess, uh, to the House of Lords in, in terms of its function being a, a house of review or, or similar indeed to the, the Senate in, in the United States. And Fraser Anning is in the, is in the Senate. Uh, the, the, the Senate um, is some, is all the members of the Senate are elected through a proportional representation uh, system rather than from an electoral district per se. Now, the electoral districts are heavily controlled by the major parties. So the, the main opportunities for people um, who, who are not with the major parties, but who don't toe the major party globalist line, their major opportunity is, is, is to go to the Senate, where they can they have a platform and they have a vote and, and they can review legislation. But they're still in a minority there. The, the cross benches in the Senate um, uh, or, uh, or I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but I think they're on or about 10 at the moment. Uh, and that includes all minor parties. And there's a, a number of minor parties there, in, including the uh, the Greens. Well, it must be more than 10. I'm just sort of doing the numbers in my head quickly. Um, but um, uh, they don't... Uh, the, the There's probably five individuals or parties that are sharing all the cross benches. That is the, the Senate seats that are not part of the major parties. And that's where Fraser Anning is. He's, he's one of those. Um, he's, uh, he certainly talks uh, against some of the key globalisation issues, such as the mass migration of people that, that have a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulty in assimilating into Western, Western culture and Western lifestyles. And he cops a lot of criticism for it. Every time he, he mentions it, he's denounced by the major parties and the, and the mainstream media as, 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 you know, the usual things. He's, he's a racist and he's this and he's that and the next thing. I don't believe he's any of those things. I, I believe he's genuinely concerned, as many Australians are, genuinely concerned that there's too many people being brought into the West that, that not only don't assimilate, but three, four, even five generations from now, they still will not have assimilated. Uh, and that's a real problem uh, and something that, that the major parties are just, are just refusing uh, to address and, and insofar as the globalists want this, this uh, migration. But coming back to Fraser Anning's uh, 
comments, he's raised the the issue of um, Sudanese uh, gangs. Now, you know, Sudan's been in a state of, of civil war and, and, and unrest for for a long time now, um, decades, and there's a lot of these people who have been moved and shunted around to, to camps. It was it was never a stable place to begin with, and and uh, and then suddenly these people are brought out of these camps a day later after a, a plane flight. They suddenly arrive in a in a Western Western nation, which is completely different, completely alien to anything they've ever experienced in their lives, and they have trouble fitting in. And, and some of the youths, in particular, uh, uh, riot and. And, and run around, they, they commit robberies and, and, and so on, and that's well documented. Uh, but the government, uh, the state government in Victoria, the, the, where Melbourne is, and, and also the federal government downplays these issues and pretends that, not so much that it isn't happening, but it, but it's happening uh, uh, at a very low level and, and very occasionally, and it's not really causing much harm, when the reality is it, it is causing some some uh, some concern among the citizenry and, and, and justifiably so and so that's what Fraser Anning was talking about and he's raised these issues about immigration before and um, and and the you mentioned um, earlier uh, um, the uh, one of the um, uh, Sudanese riots or, or, or sprees of violence and robbery took place on one of the beaches uh, in in, uh, in the Melbourne area and, and of course it's summer here in Australia so there's a lot of people down and beach right now and uh, and so there was a counter protest if you will where some of the, the citizens got together and, and decided to to make their uh, their voices heard but the mainstream media either don't cover it or they they try and say that all these people are fascists and racists and bigots which is completely untrue they're just concerned citizens that want their politicians uh, to take notice of their concerns and, and to act upon them but of course the politicians are not they're 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 taking their instructions from the globalists, and they're not listening to the the people. And, and this is uh, this is one of the big issues. Fraser Anning has, has has got a few sort of PR problems of his own. I think he's doing good things when he talks about difficulties with immigration. But he um, he's a relatively new politician. And, so, do you, uh, what do you know? What do you know about his uh, background? Well, does, he's, he a, he's, uh, does he have a family? What what kind of work did he do? Do you know anything about this? Uh, a little bit, yes. He's um, he he was. Um, uh, I'm going from memory here, so. Um, but he, um, I, I think he ran a hotel uh, for a while in in, in Queensland, and um, uh, and uh, he did that for a bit. He's not a young man. You know, he's in his in his fifties, as I understand. So he's fairly new to politics. So he's got quite a long a long life of in in private uh, business and so on. So he's. Um, He's, he's relatively new, and he joined a, a party called One Nation and, and became a senator for yeah. One Nation. And um, and there was a falling out with uh, with him and, and the leader of the party, and and the details were a little bit sketchy. But um, on the day that he uh, he started in the Senate, the Australian Federal Senate, he um, he actually quit the party and, and later joined another party, which which there was also another falling out. So he's. He's moved on from that party, and as I understand it, is is now an independent. But um, yeah. but that's um, that's that's sort of it means he's got a, a bit of a public relations issue to, to deal with there in terms of his own his own continuity and consistency in, in terms of the party he's affiliated with. And I suppose, uh, I suppose he's uh, he's got some problems with um, compromising. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be. I mean, he's, yeah. he's considered a bit of a maverick, um, and so, uh, but uh, that, that doesn't detract from what he's saying about um, about the, uh, the uh, you know the uncontrolled migration. It doesn't. It could be a, it could be a good quality. You know, these guys are, you know, they are tough. These guys that we need, they are tough. Oh, yeah. Just look uh, at Trump, uh, for God's sake. <laughs> oh yeah. He's all, all, if you look at all the flack that uh, that um, Trump and his team take every every day, the uh, the screaming media, and and yet he he holds fast and he keeps on going. I'm a huge admirer of, of President Trump and uh, and, uh, and and the things that he's achieved so far, and, and the things that hopefully he, he will yet achieve. Get, coming back to Fraser Manning, though, he's one of a, a few. There's only a, a small handful of politicians here in Australia that, that are prepared to call it as it is and just to say what there is a problem 
with migration, and not necessarily migration, but it's the amount and the sort of people that are being brought here and, uh, and, and, and to the West generally. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if you're a globalist, and, and the, the globalist idea is to, well, is to bring, um, is to integrate the entire world's population into the global economy. That's what they want to do. Now, they can't succeed throwing money at, at Central Africa. That'll just disappear with, uh, you know, corrupt tin pot dictators and that sort of thing. So that, nothing will be achieved there. Um, there's no point in bringing the best of the Africans into Europe because they're already in the economy. So you look at the, the 60, 70 percent of you know, a lot of the Africans, uh, you know, people from the subcontinent and so on, they're just not involved in the world economy. They just don't exist. So the idea is to bring as many of them as possible into the West where the jobs are and where the money is, the stability, the continuity. They don't realise they're going to destroy the West in the process, I think, but, but that's their idea. It, you know, and there was an article from the World Bank where they were decrying that nearly 3 billion people in the world don't have bank accounts. And that kind of spells it out, that the, the globalists want these people somehow to be integrated into the world economy and be, to be brought in. But, but bringing in, you know, IQ 80 people that have never you know, seen a flushing toilet or never switched on a light before, you know, and, and they're illiterate in their own language, that's just not going to work out. That's, that's just absolute pie in the sky. But yet they, they persist with it, and this seems to be their, their mission. And, and, and there's very few politicians that are prepared to talk out against it and, and to and to, to say that, look, it's, it's not working and we need to do it differently. Um, let's have migration, but not, not the sort of the, the volume and not the, not the sort of people that are coming over at the moment. There has to be a, a discussion to say, well, maybe the globalists can have some of the things they want, but if they persist in what they're doing, they just have to be stopped. And, and I wonder what, what we can do, you know, us and, and people and the listeners and, and the viewers, what, what, what can we do to, 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 to stop it, to, to bring it to an end or to, to, to reduce it to a point where it's, it's sensible and, and maybe controllable. And it has to begin with the politicians understanding they represent the people. And that's where people like Fraser Anning come in. Unless we have more people like him or the existing politicians prepared to listen, they have to accept that democracy means you represent the people who vote for you, not the globalists. And I, I wonder how we can change their minds and change that situation. Yeah, good questions. Well, for me, myself, personally, I get so joyed by seeing guys like Fraser Anning coming up because uh, you have to realize what kind of a man you need or woman in order to do what he's doing. He has to really uh, put himself out there and have these balls to do it. It's, uh, it's amazing. These guys are so valuable. And that's, I think, uh, one of our main duties is to support these guys as much as we can because they are so valuable and they will help us. You know, it, The power is coming from the people, of course. So the people need to unite and communicate with each other and have agreements and tell the truth and so on. But then you have to have these leaders who are willing to take this crap that obviously Fraser Anning is willing to do. So every time I see somebody like Fraser Anning or Matteo Salvini or any one of these guys, makes me so happy, uh, gives me hope, see. And then it's up to us to support them, support the hell out of them, yeah, and fight, yeah, yeah. And fight their enemies, of course. You know, reveal the truth about their enemies, what they are doing, their lies, you know, their hypocrisy, everything. That's that's our job. And if we could just keep doing this, we are doing it so well these days through alternative media. We just keep on doing it and do more of it. Step it up. We can really see the change. Yeah, it, it's a 2018 was was really, uh, uh, and there were some, some setbacks and disappointments, but on balance with the, you know, Viktor Orban and, and uh, in, in Poland, um, uh, you know, as you say, Matteo Silvini in, in uh, Italy, and even some of the uh, smaller uh, states, uh, I think it was the Czech Republic and, and, uh, and so on, and, and there's also Denmark. down in uh, Romania, Denmark and, uh, uh, and, and so on, and, and the, 
you know, things are changing and, and uh, they've tried to shut down Donald Trump in, in the United States. They haven't succeeded. He's, he's going to get another Supreme Court appointment soon. He's putting a lot of judges into district courts and district appeal courts, um, or his administration is. Uh, so, so there are successes that are fairly happening quietly in background that we, we don't see immediate, you know, big, big ticket results. But, but, but they're there and uh, Donald Trump is changing the whole legal landscape and a lot of these activist judges that were there uh, are starting to be replaced by people who are, are concerned with upholding the Constitution of the United States, which of course is what a, a jurist should be doing. Um, so so these, these sort of things, so, so 2018 achieved something. Look at the, uh, the AFD, uh, even, even in Sweden, the, the uh, the the the, uh, the party that was concerned about immigration and wants to represent the people, even they made some strides. But uh, I wonder if it's enough and, and whether it's moving quickly enough. It's always easy to to see the cup is half empty rather than half full, and we all fall into that trap sometimes. And and I, I hope that the momentum that was built in 2018 is going to carry through into this year, and and uh, we're going to have some major achievements here: the completion of Brexit, um, things like that, and and uh, the Donald Trump getting the wall and so on. And, and maybe there's some other achievements. Well, what do you think? Well, first of all, my uh, what I think is that we have to realize that it's because of the people. It's the people that makes this possible. If it wasn't for the support that Trump is getting, for instance, he wouldn't be able to do one thing. So it's up to us. You know, and uh, if Trump goes away, he will be replaced by somebody else. And it's up to the people to put somebody else there who can do something uh, similar as Trump. So we have to, I think we have to remember this. This is uh, the, the, hope, the power is coming from the people. So the talking that we do and the protests and, you know, the uniting, that's key to everything that's going on. You know, anything that happened in Europe is because of the people wanting this to happen. You know, Nigel Farage is a brilliant man. Uh, Victor Orban, Tommy Robinson, brilliant men, you see. But they wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for the support. So that's uh, that's my first uh, observation. And I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful for 2019. I think it's going to be wild. There will be some setbacks, I'm certain. The globalists will not surrender. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they have been working on this for so long. That's amazing. Mm. Uh, as you keep watching the, the events of this, these societies, you see how well planned and how well organized this is. So you, you actually, these days, I get surprised when I see anyone opposing them. You see this in Sweden now. Uh, there are eight political parties and two, well, there is the Nationalist Party, of course, opposing the globalists. But now there are also two other parties who are actually starting to oppose the globalist idea. And I get surprised when I see this. You know, how do they have uh, the guts to do it? You know, because the pressure is so strong from media and the establishment that these guys are still willing to say, no, I'm not so sure about this. You know. So these days, you know, earlier I was surprised about this establishment and the elite, how they were talking and everybody was agreeing. Uh, but I'm not surprised about this anymore. Today I'm surprised when somebody is opposing it. And there's more of this lately. Yeah. Denmark, I'm, I'm very optimistic about Denmark. I know some Danish guys that I talk to, and they are not as optimistic as I am. But I see the signs in Denmark. You know, they, they are actually doing something. It's great to see. But yeah. as I said, we will have setbacks in 2019. I'm certain about this. But the pressure from the people is going to win this battle. I'm uh, quite certain about this. It's going to be a long, long uh, fight. 
Wow. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'll, I'll put a link uh, at the bottom of the um, of the uh, of this video where it's, uh, I think, the penultimate or the second last scene in in the um, uh, 1984 movie where um, uh, the, uh, the the Winston character is being being tortured by the um, by the uh, you know the main big brother heavy and uh, and uh, he says uh, there that um, in that that scene which I think is quite a gripping scene given given what we're talking about and the globalization of the world or the attempt at globalization he says um, in the end the people will beat you they will tear you to pieces and yeah. and, and I, I believe that in the end that that probably will happen what well, one of the the sort of strange twists that occurred to me a couple of days ago and I've started a video on it or scripting one is. Uh, by doing what they're doing, the globalists are actually creating the conditions for a return to Marxist socialism. They're, yeah. they're, as, as much as they're, they're getting people to oppose them on, on, on the sort of the issues we talk about, the you know, Ocasio-Cortez and, and those sort of people, they, they wouldn't exist and they wouldn't have the following. I mean, she, she's on just about every talk show you can imagine. And, and she's not a bright, bright lady, as far as I can see. She's, she's, she's fairly simple, and she just talks leftist talking points. She just repeats them over and over. And it seems she doesn't really understand even what she's saying, but she gets this huge support. And if you get enough people like that, you get people like that's how the Bolshevik Revolution sort of, you know, the, the groundswell that supported that. And, and, and if you look at the, the if you read the sort of the, bol the minutes for some of the meetings that the Bolsheviks had with Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin and Kamenev and and uh, you know Voroshilov and all the, all those people, they they were saying, well, the enemies of the revolution, anyone who will oppose us, has to, anyone who opposes us has to be killed, anyone who might oppose us has to be killed, and that's where the you know the mass murdering came in. That the revolution had to survive. Now, if we head into situations where the globalists actually create the very conditions that will will uh, undermine them, we we could be seeing a, a, a ultimately a confrontation between socialists. Uh, who, who, by virtue of the, the globalisation push, are going to be marginalised as well. I mean, at the moment, they're being placated, saying, well, it's all those white middle-class males, you know, it's all those straight guys, they're doing it to you. And, and the globalist propaganda in that sense and the agitation through the universities is really working. But, but once that's achieved, you know, they're going to say, well, hold on, we want to control the means of production. We want to have free health care. We want to have free this and free education. And we want a living wage. We want that. And at that point, when they actually say, this is what you have to give us, globalists, the globalists aren't going to be able to deliver it or they're going to tell them to, to get lost. And that's when that could get exciting. So I see there's various strands moving, moving, uh, you know, it, it's like a matrix of moving parts. And, and I, I wonder, I, <laughs> I wonder where the bits are going to land. Uh, it, but, but we live in interesting times. And it, yeah. You sort of get the feeling that, that that somehow we're being inadvertently, without us really realizing, it, we're part of uh, part of something big in history. That that, that 100 years yeah. now, kids will be sitting in high schools reading about this and being taught about it, and and, um, uh, and it'll be because pe people in the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution, they didn't fully appreciate that they were part of history until afterwards. Perhaps Trotsky. Trotsky was maybe the only one that actually grasped that point. Um, I see. But it's uh, interesting times ahead. <laughs> It's very interesting. It's great to be part of it, I think. You know, it's fun and you get pissed off a lot of times, but you know, it's an interesting existence. It is, you know, and it's uh, you learn so much about people. And it's great to see this uh, unity that has started to grow tremendously. You know, I talk to people all over the place and you feel connected. Because they are experience similar things to, that I am experience, experiencing. And like Australia, I was surprised to see what's going on in Australia. I was, when I started to learn about it. Uh, and I saw, my God, these guys are having the same problems. And it's the same agenda. And it's the same guys doing it. It's, uh, it's like a scripted plan. It is, of course. Oh, it is. But it I'll... is, and it's, it's it's well coordinated. You've got to oh, give yeah. it to these guys. They've done a good job of it. Um, <laughs> how, how, can, how can you dis, how can you disenfranchise nearly a billion people 
<laughs> almost at the same time. But they, they, they're good. Um, it, it's just as a, a little thing, I mean, some years ago, I, I used to do a lot of business travel around the world. And, and, um, and I had to, one, one time, I had to go from Los Angeles to New York to, to London. And it was in a, quite a short space of time. So I was, I was really just stopping for a meeting and going straight on, catching another flight. And so I ended up in one 24-hour cycle. I saw the newspapers in LA and New York and London um, within the same 24 hours, and and uh, and I put one of the, the newspapers in my bag. But but um, when I looked at them, there was a an article in the Los Angeles paper that was talking about violence against women, how women should divorce their husbands. This was one of the first building blocks that the, the globalists did to try and undermine the family unit. So it was saying violence against women is at epidemic proportions. A local uh, university had studied it and a local academic was saying that one in two women are being beaten by their husbands and this and that and, and how it's part of the, the patriarchy. And, and I, I straight away, because I'm a bit of a history buff, straight away I noticed the Marxist language that was, was in there. And that, that was a giveaway. It was probably propaganda. But I didn't really think much about it. But, but later on, I, I was reading the, the Los Angeles and, of course, the London paper when I got there. And, you know, they had exactly the same story in them. Um, saying oh. exactly the same stats. And all I did was change the name of the university and change the name of the gender studies academic that was saying it. It was clearly an internationally coordinated bit of propaganda to strike at the English-speaking Western world all at the same time. And uh, and that, that really began to open my eyes, just the scale of the globalist organisation, how they were feeding propaganda internationally, all coordinated, all on cue, all backed up by acad supposed academic studies. But all of it was bullshit. It was all invented simply to undermine the, well, in this case, the, the family unit. But but um, that that just shows how good these guys are. It also shows the control, level of control they have. I mean, wow, yeah. that, that's pretty impressive. And, and that is. just shows how good how good we have to be to combat it. And and, and 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 this was in the days before really there was any alternative media on the internet. So so the the uh, the, uh, the mainstream media pretty much controlled the narrative then. Now it's different. But, but but back then that was how it was. I, I, did you notice that sort of thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they didn't uh, count on alternative media, did they? They didn't have a plan for this. They didn't expect alternative media to be opposing them. And now uh, alternative media is growing more and more popular, and it's the far right. They had a, they talked about this on Swedish TV in a debate. Uh, recently, they talked about this uh, quest. They had this question: How come the, the far right is so successful on <laughs> alternative media? You know, they didn't. Uh, they didn't expect this, and they don't have a plan for it. So now they sort of, they are sort of desperate. These people are talking, telling the truth about them. You know, they can't really handle this. So they are, of course, trying to work on censorship and shutting channels down and so on but uh, you know that's the th this is what we do and this is what's going to change it yeah I, I, I totally agree with you it's uh, it's quite impressive they had this plan to conquer basically right and then they started to prepare the the population uh, so that they could be conquered. That's what they did. So they attacked the family unit. They attacked values, you know, decency, honor, justice. You see, so that's what they have been doing, and they have been doing a great job. But thanks to alternative media, we have this great opportunity now to turn this around and start to look at these guys, what they are doing. Uh, it's interesting, uh, fascinating times. Uh, there, there, you know, all revolutions eventually, you know, all the controlling groups, uh, they never see 
never see it coming. It, it comes up behind them. It comes out of left field. But they think they control it and suddenly kabam, and it's just right there in front of them. And, and, then, and then it's too late and they lose their nerve and they, they run for cover or dive under the desk or something. And, and I wonder how far we, we are uh, away from that now. If you look at when Donald Trump came to, to the presidency, it was such a shock to everybody, me included, by the way. And, and, and I remember looking at it and thinking, I can hardly believe this. Um, but, but there it was. He was president of the United States, and, 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 and you know, thank, thank God he is. But they, they, the shock, the shock that the, the, you know, the globalists suffered, it, it didn't last long. They came back quickly, you know, well organized. It was effective. They, they had their talking points, and they went after him. And they had their, their operatives in the deep state to, to use. Um, various organs of the American government to go after him or to stymie him or to slow him down or simply to distract him from his program, these sorts of things. And, they, and they're still doing it. They're still doing it now. And, and they're still quite effective at it. And, uh, and, and, they, and until President Trump and his team create an effective counter strategy to that that's just as well organized, uh, then, then he's, he's going to be always Back on the back foot, trying to trying to push them off as they keep on coming after him, and he's he's done a good job so far, and, and he's no slouch, and he's a property developer from New York, and, and I've I've done business in New York, and I know how, how tough some of these guys are, and he's he's uh, you know, he he can take it, he can take it, but but it's still a lot of work to deal with all this noise that's coming at him, and, and yet you know put through his legislative. Um, uh, uh, programs and, and implement his policies and things like that, or, or, or through the Senate and the House at least. So, uh, but, but it shows how good these guys are, and I, I, and we need to be that good. That's how good we need to be. Yeah. Um, in, in, in to support the, the uh, other politicians and parties and so on. Uh, and even if you look at parties like, um, you know, UKIP or whatever in Britain, and they. The, the globalists, I'm sure, will find ways of infiltrating those parties with agitators and people that'll create problems or, or um, you know, sending, uh, sending people in there to try and uh, disrupt them and, and, and slow their progress and these sorts of things. So it, it, it's a huge, a huge task ahead and, and we've just got to get, get a lot better. But, but I, 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 I think we can win. I really do. And, and if, especially if the Trump administration prevents the closing down of alternative voices. You know, the, this idea that that, um, that uh, the, the globalists through the banks can just can just lean on and get heavy with uh, you know some of the payment processes and uh, even some of the platforms and get people kicked off. You know, like Sargon and, and uh, or, or Alex Jones and those sort of people. There needs to be legislation. I believe there needs to be some sort of legislation there that that, that um, holds them accountable for those decisions. Yeah. And they can't just arbitrarily say, well, it's our terms of service, but the terms of service are just bullshit, vague nonsense. That, that, that's, uh, that, and, and when that's done, that'll be a step. Uh, but but what, what else can we do? What, what do you think? Well, well, just keep doing what we are doing, I think, and just step it up. It's uh, You mentioned... Uh, the UK, uh, you know, they can't afford to lose the UK. They are sort of losing the United States and possibly Brazil, another big country. They can't afford to lose the UK. And that's, I think this is why we see the UK now being such a mess. It's so, it's so confusing what's going on in the UK. So I think they are fighting hard to keep the UK and the globalists. So UK will be extremely important for the future. And it, uh, there is a big responsibility. I'm sorry to say this, but the UK citizens, they have a huge responsibility right now. And if they win, this will be extremely important to all of us. UK is, is a very important nation. It is. So they yes. can't afford they can't afford to lose it. They are losing Italy. That's another important nation, of course. But the UK is like the pearl here in Europe. So uh, it's uh, very exciting to see this. And I'm so you know it makes me sick to see what they are doing in the UK. The globalists, the politicians, really makes me sick. And I I feel sad. 
for the UK citizens. I think the UK citizens will have to, uh, you know, they have realized that they are actually oppressed. But this realization has to go one step further, I think. They have to really understand, I mean, this is the real thing. This is a, a battle. They are actually trying to wipe them out so uh, and take democracy away from them. It's uh, very sad to see this. But I also have hopes for the UK. You know, these are strong, strong people. I love the British. It's great people. And uh, I just hope that uh, they can uh, uh, turn, you know, go against these guys for real. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I hope so too. It's um, I, it, it still staggers me, and I still can't understand how the the people in the or the, the elected representatives in the people's parliament actually don't represent the people. It, it, how could it have come to this? Uh, and it's still the, the mind boggles just thinking about it. Um, can't they acquire a conscience and understand that they're they, they represent the British people, not not the globalist um, goons. Uh, but uh, it seems not. And, and until, as you say, until the people stand firm, they may be. And they just remind the the, uh, the people, uh, they remind the, uh, the members of Parliament that they have a duty to the people of their country, not to the globalists. Then, then maybe we'll get somewhere. Uh, I think there is. Uh, I think there is this idea. I heard about this idea among politicians. There were some discussions that I was listening to here in Sweden. And uh, the idea is that they don't really represent the people. The idea is that they represent themselves. You see, they are elected, which means that uh, people put confidence in them to do what they feel is right. So as mm. soon as they are elected, uh, they don't really have to listen. To the people, to the people anymore. Mm. They just have to listen to them to themselves. So if they like it, it's good. If they don't like it, it's bad. No matter what the people says. Yeah. There, there was this <laughs> very interesting idea, and I think this is a common idea among Western politicians. You know, I know what to do. I was elected. They like me. You know. I can do mm. what I want. Yeah, it's you, you know that, that would that would work if, um, or potentially could work if, if the politicians are very clear about their views and their attitudes and uh, and would articulate the policies that they believe in and, and that they'll put forward. Because then the people could vote on on that. But um, they say, you know, as, as you were suggesting a bit earlier, they say whatever it takes to get elected, then they they go off and, and do. Uh, do something else, um, or, or maybe maybe don't articulate their views at all at the outset. But that, that, that that's where that's what democracy is meant to be. The, the, uh, somebody in a community, in a, a town or a village, they would represent those people, and everybody would know that person and know that person's views and attitudes and, and so on. And even if you look at say British politics with um, uh, <coughs> with um, uh, William Gladstone, who was prime minister in the eighteen. 70s and 1880s, around that time, uh, he would get up on the hustings. You know, he'd get up, he'd stand up on the on the soapbox type thing, and he, he, he'd uh, say, "Well, these are my policies. This is what I'm going to do, and this is what I I believe in." And uh, and then the, the people can vote for, "Well, I like this guy's policies, but but not that guy's, or I like this or that, and so on." And, and that's how it's meant to work, but it doesn't work that way anymore. Um, but people are too frightened to state their policies. To, um, uh, because they might be ridiculed or, or, or something like that, or, or, or simply because they think not, uh, not enough people will agree with them. Um, but uh, uh, Donald Trump is, is a, a change in that. He said, well, this is what I believe in, and this is what I'm going to... And he's actually doing it. Um, he's probably one of the few politicians in the whole world who, who is actually doing what he says he's going to do. And he's been quite clear about it. Uh, I, I think, you know, in terms of saying, well, here are my policies, vote for me if you want to, he did that, and, and one of the very few that does it, and he won. Uh, and so, coming back to your earlier comment, we've all got a duty, or certainly the American citizens have a, a duty, I believe, to, to support him in those endeavours. The things that he wants to do are good things, and they're worthwhile, and they'll change, they'll change the pattern of globalisation forever if he's successful. And this is why they're fighting him so hard, probably. And as you say, because uh, the United States and Britain together, I think they make up something like 23 or 24 percent of the world economy. 
Um, right. That's a big chunk of the world economy. So if those guys aren't, aren't controlled by the globalists, um, it, then it's, it's it's a tough gig for them to, to pull off the globalisation scam. Um, but they, they they possibly think they're going to get away with it at the, at the moment. Um, and I, I also think about Trump, that uh, part of his success is that he actually listened. Yeah, and I think he's the guy who will listen, you see. And that, that's, I think, we are looking for these kind of politicians who, when they get elected, they continue to listen. You know, they understand that this is part of my job, to listen and understand what the people feel and what, they, what their problems are and so on. And I think Trump is one of those guys, and that's part of his success. I think he yes. never stopped. He never stopped listening. You see, and uh, yeah. you know, I'm leading a country. I mean, why wouldn't I listen to the people, the country that I'm leading? I would be crazy, you know, to stop listening, wouldn't it? Exactly. I mean, it's not rocket science, for goodness' sake. The people have elected you, and and then they're they're. Uh, you know, they're the, the voters in that country. So why wouldn't you? Rep it's the, the, the craziness is the people that don't, is the politicians who don't represent the people. That's the madness that we're living in. <laughs> and we need to get back to the, the, the situation where they actually represent the people in, in their country that voted for them and, and, and the other citizenry. Um, it's absolute madness. Um, but, uh, but it's going to be a big year. And, and as you say, if we keep on doing what we're doing uh, and we keep on sharing this information, and, and, and for, for those uh, who, who are listening and viewing, tell other people about, about uh, uh, Sanity for Sweden's channel. B bring, bring more, more listeners and viewers here and, and listen to, to, to what's being said and, and share this around um, because that's going to make a difference as well if you're all talking about it and, and letting other people know and they can come here and, and get more information. I mean, Stefan's got a video I think out every day now with the news. So, so come here and listen to that and, and, and get, get that update. Uh, and it's something that's, uh, uh, if you share it around, all of these things make a difference. Maybe a small difference, but when in combination uh, with, with uh, all the other uh, uh, commentators on the alternative media, it makes a huge difference. So, so, so do that. Um, yeah, I think, or, I, th I think we, we need to understand what kind of an impact this has. You know, it all started with people communicating with each other on uh, social and alternative media that's how it started that's how trump got elected that's how brexit happened it's because of people communicating so um uh, i think people need to understand this how important this is nothing would happen if it wasn't for people communicating with each other talking about the crimes of the globalists and the politicians you know telling the truth getting agreements and supporting each other. This is uh, this is key. Absolutely, nothing will happen if we stopped. The in if the internet was shut down tomorrow, we would find other ways to communicate. Because you know, I certainly hope that it won't. But uh, this is key to us. And likewise to you. I I watch your channel. It's great. So. Uh, support and listen and share and so on. That's uh, that's what we need to do, and find the people that think alike, you know, and start protesting, uh, hit the streets, join the movement, put on a yellow vest. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's yeah. working in France. It's working yeah. in France. <laughs> it is. It's, like it's, it's spreading around now. There's a, in Britain. There's the yellow vest everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it isn't it fun to imagine uh, the feelings and the thought process in the French government uh, presently, and how Macron how is he feeling about this? Um, I know he was totally shocked by this, what happened in France. He thought he would just gonna do what he wanted to do, and then all of a sudden he's got a huge problem. So uh, I love this. It's great fun to watch this. Yeah, when the globalists sort of set him up to say, well, look, we'll, we'll make sure you can have this easy gig. And do, <laughs> we'll just do what we tell you to do. And he, he'll say, it would be an easy job. And, and now look at him. He's thinking, you didn't tell me about this. Well, what's, you're not paying me enough to put up with this. <laughs> I can't walk out of the house, for God's sake. Yeah, it's beautiful. 
Well, girl, yeah, we, we've done nearly 45 minutes. The time seems, oh, to, wow. it seems to be gone gone so quickly. I don't know. Um, uh, look, Ariel, you, you've been with um, Sanity for Sweden and Tastus today, and it's been a, a pleasure having you, and, and uh, we'll look forward to doing this again next week and uh, and, and try to keep them uh, as regular as possible. So thanks very much, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Great talking to you, Tastus. Great. Okay, bye, bye now. Bye.